Welcome to this live recording of the Trending Globally podcast from the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs at Brown University. I'm Ed Steinfeld, the director of the Institute. I am so happy today to be joined by Randall Poster, a world-renowned music supervisor in the film and television industry, and also a Brown University graduate class of 1983. Randy has shaped the musical identity and sound aesthetic of just an unbelievable range of films over the past 30 years. In addition to working with directors like Richard Linklater, Todd Phillips, Sam Mendes, and Todd Haynes, Randy supervised the scores and soundtracks of all of Wes Anderson's films, and he's worked with Martin Scorsese on Hugo, The Aviator, The Wolf of Wall Street, and, and The Irishman. The list just goes on and on, it's extraordinary. Randy won a Grammy Award for his work on the soundtrack of the 2011 HBO series, Boardwalk Empire. But for all of Randall Poster's incredible career achievements today, we're gonna to talk about a particular project he's worked on, one relevant to the current moment in which we're all living, and that's the Netflix smash hit, Tiger King. Randy, welcome to Trending Globally. Nice to be with you, Ed. It's so great to have you. When you first became aware of Tiger King, right. what did you make of the story? Well, you know, we, we got involved sort of as the episodes were, were taking shape, or I mean, before even they were really broken down into the eventual episodes. And it just was really, you know, at first we were just talking about like these crazy cat people, you know? Um, and so we knew it was, um, we knew it was somewhat sensational, um, but really couldn't have anticipated the response that, 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 that the, sh the shows have gotten. You know, I want to get into so many of the social aspects of the documentary and how it relates to the music, but forgive my ignorance, but could we step back a little bit and could you explain to me really what does a music supervisor do? Yeah, well, a music supervisor, um, you know, on, uh, it works differently on different film projects, but really, ideally, what a music super supervisor does is, you know, uh, the person is the person who helps a director or the filmmakers um, sort of imagine and then execute a musical strategy for the movie. So it, it, it really um, depends on sort of what the initial needs are. Sometimes when you're doing a feature film, there are on-camera performances that you have to prepare. And then in a, in, a, in a documentary where things are a little bit more, it's a little bit more of a, uh, initially more of a sort of passive musical relationship that you have with the, with, with the storytelling, you know, it, it sort of becomes like, well, how do you plot the sound? Who do you find to create the, 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 the wealth of, of the musical element or the, and the majority of the musical element and sort of what other, songs or um, what other variety you might, you, you, you might incorporate into, into the musical spectrum of a, of a, of a, of a film or of a series of, of, of episodes. So are you thinking both about the total sound aesthetic for the whole project and then you're also going scene by scene for yeah, specific- Yeah, it, it, gets, it, gets it gets more microscopic as, as, as the process narrows because in a certain sense, I mean, you, they're, they're sort of starting to, they establish the story and then the story evolves. So, I mean, you, you, in, in this situation where you start with, say, the first episode and try to establish, like, okay, what is the musical tapestry? What is the musical identity? And then you, you, you push it forward as best you, as best you can or as, as needed, you know? And then at a certain point, you say, like, well, how do we lend some variety to this? How do we lend some emphasis to this? How do we, you know, use, sometimes use songs for a moment of pause or a moment of reflection? Um, you know, for instance, where you have a song in, in the last episode, you know, where all of a sudden you see the guy on the jet ski and you, you hear something, you hear Eye of the Tiger by Survivor, which is kind of an obvious musical choice, but it's kind of nice that it comes sort of at the end and it's sort of not with anybody in a tiger cage, really, you know, so... In a sense, you know, there's a moment where you're 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 not in the you're not in a zoo or a, or an animal sanctuary. You're you're on the water and on a seeing a guy on a jet ski, and yet you're bringing some of the tiger of it all to that moment. 
Right. And so it, when you're creating that moment, are you working really directly in person with the director and the well, film editor? It's so, so, I mean, I think in documentary, you know, edit, editorial really shapes the storytelling, right? There isn't, there isn't necessarily like a script that you start with it. Okay, let's go shoot the script. The story evolves as the editor and the directors shape it, right? And there's so much music in this movie. It, 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 it's interesting. It's like, there's so much music in this show. And a lot of it is really not really calling very much attention to itself. And so, you know, I, I think you just sort of, you start to plot things and you kind of say, okay, this seems to be the sound of the show. And then really it's much more of like, okay, here's a sequence where, you know, we're using, there's a process in a film. We, we had a composer on the movie, um, a guy named Mark Mothersbaugh, who I've worked with previously on some of Wes's movies and on some other things, Mark Mothersbaugh notably, um, the leader of a rock band called Devo. Um, and Mark and his crew, he has a, a production studio called Mutato. And so sort of his team worked on it together. And so they don't really, they're, they're not ready to start making the music as you need to use music as you start to try to get a feel for the show. And so there's a process where you're using, it, it's called temp music, you know, where you're basically, for the most part, you're taking, say, film scores or, or scores or pieces of music from other sources, like from other, other, other films, other, other, you know, artists records. And then at a certain point you, you know, those, some of those get replaced by original score. And then some of those things, you know, you, you, you feel like, well, the piece that we have in there, hypothetically, it's from Star Wars. We're not going to be able to afford that or use that. So we have to then go and find some things that, will work as those pieces work that are more affordable. I mean, that's another part of being a music supervisor is that there is, there, there's also, there's the creative part of it. And then there's also the, the business and logistical part of it in terms of getting permission and, 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 and um, uh, licensing existing material. It's, I mean, it's fascinating. And I, if we can later on, we'll circle back to some of the technical aspects, but I just have to ask you, how, how do you think and why do you think Tiger King has become such a social phenomenon? I think it's, you know, we're dealing with a lot of very heavy issues right now, right. of course, with, with COVID-19, but I, I think Tiger King has become it's become a social phenomenon in the context of this moment in which we're dealing right. with a global pandemic. And right. it has to be related somehow, I think, but why and how in your mind? Well, I mean, I think to a certain degree, I mean, I think part of the phenomenon is that people are captive audiences. So people are all looking for uh, a content to, you know, there's, a, there's a, a voracious appetite for content. And I think it just sort of seemed to hit at a moment where even just the you know, you, you, you look at that, the image that the, the, the image of Joe exotic with the, with the tiger, that's sort of the, the, the key art of the, of the show. And it's just, it's, 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 an, it's so compelling or, and it's such an invitation to look at it. And then I, you know, I think that it's, it's really remarkable that this character, Joe exotic, who on so many levels is just, you know, is, is, you know, I mean, I guess at a certain point we're all, those of us who watch a show or you watch a show is, somewhat uh, left to us to really kind of judge his activities of whether he's guilty or not guilty or not that guilty or less guilty than maybe others were. But for a guy who's sort of this, what's that like, you know, a, a gun-toting homosexual polygamist with 200 big cats. And the fact is like, he's somehow so relatable, <laughs> right. you know? And that, I mean, you kind of relate to him. You get, you, 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 you're drawn into his personality and he, he, he's very human, you know, he's rendered in a very human way. And I think that in contrast to maybe some of the other people in this country who we are force fed on a nightly basis, I, I, think, I think that there's the, 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 the strange, his strange humanity is comforting in that sense that somehow it is a um, reflection of all of our, our, our own, everyone's own sort of like unique personality in a sense, or it's, a, it's, 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 
it just makes you feel that, you know, as crazy as we are, that somehow it's somehow to me, I think it's a, it's a, it's a signal of hope or something for what, in some crazy way. I don't know. I think that's, that's at least my impression of it. Yeah. When I started watching, you know, I started as, as a somewhat reluctant viewer. I thought, why, why do I really want to waste my time with this? And as soon as I started watching, I couldn't stop. Yeah. And I think part of it was that, yeah, Joe, this Joe Exotic character who's so central, he's very compelling and, and in some ways sympathetic. I mean, there's that moment where he, I think it was Joe Exotic, describes his, when he came out to his father and his right. father tells him, just promise me, you know, you, you won't... It, was it attend his funeral? Yeah, yeah. he says, he says, I, so Joe, he tells a story that he, that he, he's, he's gay and he, and he, and he, and he's miserable and he feels so alone and he, he drives the, the, his, the, the car off the bridge. Yeah, he attempts suicide. Yeah. And, and then you say, and his father says, and he comes out to his family after he survives and his father says, um, shake my hand and promise me. And you're waiting for him to say, promise me you won't do this to yourself or, Promise, and he says, "Promise me you won't come to my funeral." Which, which I've never heard. It's something I've never heard before. You know, it, it was so unique in just that description. Um, and and I think that was a moment for me that really, I it really drew me into the story in in a way that I wouldn't have otherwise. But then that's so crazy is that at the end of the series, it's like you see him with his mother and father, with his mother and father. So you know, again, I don't know. Part of it too is like, well, you know, I don't know that we as he performs for the camera and tells the story. I mean. I, you know, you can take it at face value. And then at some point you sort of say, well, I'm not quite sure if everything he tells me is the truth. But I mean, just by, even just by looking at him or the fact of his, you know, the details of his relationships. Um, so just so, so unique. Yeah. And so that gets to the other side. Again, speaking personally, I felt sympathy for him, but total skepticism. You know, is anything that he's saying true? Because he's this complete P.T. Barnum kind of guy and whether he's running for president or running for the governor of Kansas, I thought, this is crazy, you know, gay, polygamous, gun-toting guy who doesn't know anything about politics. He's running for office. But then again, we are in this kind of P.T. Barnum moment. I don't mean to make a partisan statement here, but but our president has that kind of quality to him. And it's, it's, I mean, it may be captivating or appalling, whatever, but it, it just, Joe Exotic felt like a man of current American moment. Right, right. Well, I mean, again, it, you know, he was consumed with being a reality TV star, right? I mean, that's sort of part of the story. And, you know, yes, our president is, a, was, is, is, I think, continues to be a reality TV star. And, you know, I guess there is that parallel. And I guess, I mean, it, it's crazy, but is he on a certain level, is he sort of the antidote to, to Trump on a certain level? You know, he's, he's sort of seemingly on a certain level so accepting and, and, and defies every kind of convention. Like you're saying, he's, you know, he's, he carries a gun. He, you know, he's, he's, he's a libertarian, but I, I mean, and, and also the way I think what was struck me so much about, about the story was how these, all of these people that he was surrounded with, they were so dedicated to him. Right, right. He has you know, this charisma somehow. Yeah, or, and, or, the, and, or he made, I mean, Again, they showed other elements where he was would fly off the hook, and but he sort of made this family of misfits, you know. And I mean, that woman who really at the end is is really kind of a, a, a sagacious character. The woman who lost her hand, you know, right. loses her hand and is back at the park like four days later, and and just again very rational and very understanding, um, and it's very compelling. Um, yeah, and I thought this also it was a statement. I mean, it's very hard to generalize from any of these outlandish characters, but still, it was not a statement about the coasts. It wasn't a statement about right. New York and California. It was a statement, I think, about, well, this is middle America. This is flyover country, so to right. speak. Right. Well, I think it's also, I mean, just to say about with the, 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 the shadows surrounding Joe Exotic, it's like, I don't know if whether it's episode three or four, where all of a sudden you, you realize, oh, they're all, they're all like addicted to crystal meth. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. That's sort of like another turn in the story. It's like, oh, I get it now. They're all on they're all on crystal meth. Right. So there's the whole drug issue suffusing things pretty remarkably. And also, and you mentioned it earlier, this idea that everybody is the media star. Everybody's 
in it for ratings, whether it's Carol Baskin or right. Doc Annell or Joe Exotic, for sure, that they're right. all just trying to generate this content. Well, it's all, yeah, I mean, it's quite sophisticated when they're talking about, you know, the whole copyright infringement and being on the, being the first thing that comes up on Google and attracting enough attention and getting enough likes or getting enough viewers. I mean, the, the, the ends that people will go to, you know, to find, to, to find celebrity. Yeah. And I don't want to draw kind of ridiculous comparisons, but in some ways I felt that the um, Joe Exotic relationship to social media and then his relationship to Carol Baskin, aside from the fact that it be ultimately became criminal, it has a kind of a feel, a similarity to the way, say, President Trump deals with the media. You know, it's his arch enemy, yet it's right. his partner in right. driving ratings. And right. I thought the documentary captured that so precisely. Right. right. It's like, um, you know, I think the lessons that Trump learned from worldwide wrestling association you know that you you know you, you you pit the people against each other and it's sort of this kind of feigned rivalry you know yeah wrestlemania, WrestleMania. then played out with big cats and yeah. then mirroring to some extent our contemporary public life yeah well what about on the issue of sexuality because that also is so present i think in the film whether it's um LGBT um, issues or polygamy. And it, it's, it's so, it's pr particularly for Joe Exotic, uh, it's so much part of his public persona. Yeah. Well, I mean, you think about it too, it's just, it's, it's like he also is so romantic. I mean, at least it's portrayed that way, right? Right. Is that it's, it's so romantic. He wants to be in, you know, in the sense that like, you know, that he chooses to get married that he chooses to change his name, to share the name with right. his spouses. I mean, it just, it just sort of, it's, it's so unpredictable. Um, yeah, I, I felt that way at, at, at all the time. And it, it um, made me feel torn between sympathy and kind of a, a feeling of, wow, that's really different and yeah. out there. And it, it was really quite incredible. Um, I have a, a, a slightly different question about the about documentaries in in general. Um, so in this particular film, there there are films within films within films. You have you have people like Joe Exotic and Carol Baskin generating all of their content, and then right. you have a filmmaker trying to make a film. I'm sorry, his right. name Rick. Uh, Eric Good. Eric Rick, Good. Uh, well, no, I mean the, the guy from oh, right, uh, right, 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 Inside right. Edition, who's right. who's who's um, portrayed, and and so he's trying to make this film, but his content is all lost. And then you have the filmmakers themselves, right? So, the project you participated in. What's the nature of truth telling from the perspective of those who are making the formal documentary, and then having within it all of these other internal uh, document. Well, I mean, I think what was unique about this was that it was, you know, that there was then, there was, there was all this footage to draw from, right? I mean, in terms of what they had available to use to sort of show the, the march of time, really. Yeah. Um, you know, I, and I think it's, it's, again, I think it, there's the, to, to use a sort of a film school cliche, there's the sort of the Rashomon element in this story. It's like, well, the truth, the, the different perspectives telling you the, the various truths, you know, their own truth, the manipulated truth, like what is the truth? I think that, I mean, in a certain, in, in terms of the, 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 the last part of the, sh of the, of the show where there's, you know, who's, who's the guilty party, who's really the manipulator. Right. You know? And, and so, I mean, I think that the, the, the filmmakers are giving you, the viewer, an opportunity to sort of use your best judgment to figure out, okay, what's the truth, the truth here? And that's where, in a sense, too, where I think the the outlying characters, in the end, the last two episodes, the outlying characters, how their testimony gives you a little bit insight into like, and clearly you like Joe Exotic better than you like, you know, than you like, um, uh, um, Carol Baskin or Jeff Jeff Lowe yeah, or any of these yeah, other yeah right is there, and here I'm just speaking for myself but I yeah. mean these are not admirable characters but it is true that I, I think Joe Exotic is probably presented the most favorably of any yeah. of them I mean I, and it's also interesting too is that you fought, you know with Carol Baskin you look I guess you kind of accept that she killed her husband right and that kind of just you kind of 
breeze by, you know? I mean, you kind of like, oh, okay, she killed her husband. Back <laughs> It's really crazy. Ex ante, when, I mean, when you were first starting to work on this project, did, did you have a um, kind of a, 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 a lesson in mind? Did you, did you have a sense of what this project was ultimately trying to convey? Or, or did it just seem like, you know, kind of a light entertainment? Yeah, I, I mean, I thought it was sort of an anthropological kind of study when I sort of was getting into it. Because Eric Good, the filmmaker, is, is a big conservationist and animal rights advocate in terms of he has a big, you know, uh, a turtle, tortoise, sanctuary. He's been, you know, that's what he sort of dedicated his life to. But it was, I mean, I guess in a way, I, 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 as, it, as it evolved, you know, you know, that I kept thinking, just thinking to myself, God, this is really good. You know, it's really great storytelling. Yeah, I, I have to agree. Can I ask a little bit more on the technical side? Is there a particular moment in the documentary that um, you felt the music and the imagery really worked powerfully? You know, you know I have. You know, I, first of all, I want to say that I, I, the a woman who works with me regularly, a woman named Megan Curry, was very actively involved in the project. And I think, really, to tell you the truth, you know, it was, you know, it, it, the music in in this film. I mean, there may be a couple of standout moments. You know, we use a Tom Waits song. We're saying like the the um, the use of "Eye of the Tiger," but really, it, you know, you just wanted to create kind of the atmospheric or enable the filmmakers to create the the, the musical atmosphere that would carry the story through and not call too much attention to itself and not be too too flamboyant. There's there's no need to you know there was you weren't going to be able to compete with these characters and there was no need to impede the storytelling with kind of any sort of flashy music moments except in these couple of areas that the filmmakers you know uh, um, sort of pinpointed as as areas of pause or or an area or a moment of reflection. I guess the most flamboyant music moments are the ones where Joe Exotic is doing oh, his Joe, own, you know, right. he's this aspirational country singer, yeah. politician and everything else, yeah. in addition to Zookeeper. Yeah, I mean, that's, a yeah, I mean, again, I mean, we, that's something good to talk about. I mean, it's also is that that's not, he neither wrote nor actually sang those songs. Um, so that's the other, I mean, again, right, great. I mean, again, he's the, the, another part, of it. he's this seemingly this, he's this, he's this, zookeeper country singer you know it's like, it's like he couldn't make it up who who does were, were those songs um commercially produced did somebody own the rights to those songs? yeah yeah so we had to go and we had to license those songs from the the writer performer yeah it's so interesting if it's okay i'd like to step back a little bit and talk about some of the academic and scholarly issues you've been um, working with us at the Watson institute okay, and brown generally on, um, you've been really a key person in working with us on developing the John F. Kennedy Jr. Initiative um, for Documentary Film and Social Progress. Do you want to say just a bit about some of your own thoughts and aspirations for, for that well, initiative? I, mean, I, think, I mean, to your point about, you know, to your point about, you know, what is the truth or pursuing the truth or rendering the truth, you know, I think in... Um, this specifically, as we started this in this in this day and age, is that I think that rendering the truth or 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 tracing some of the nuances of the truth are of vital importance to this democracy. And so I think it's been the objective to bring films and filmmakers to Brown who can, you know, tell unique and compelling stories that both, that, that give the, the audience um, an insight into a larger truth in the, in the scope of the particular details, you know, of a particular film. I feel that one of the things you've really helped me under, to understand is that on the one hand, um, film and the arts are an important avenue for truth and truth telling. Yeah. And, and for that reason, we've been working very closely with the Brown Arts Initiative here. Uh, at the same time, one has to understand ha this medium and how it's produced and, and developed so that one could also be a critical consumer of, of, right. of the product. Yeah. You know, again, I think we're, we're, our objective is to 
give Brown students the opportunity to get a little bit closer to the process um, with the hope that some of the people in our audience will be inspired to, to look forward to making movies, you know? Um, and so I, you know, hopefully that's, that's, that's a byproduct of our, our screening series and also some of the forums that we had planned that we're going to put out, you know, hopefully be able to, 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 um, host in the, in the fall and going forward. Can you say a word about John F. Kennedy Jr. and the ways in which he inspired some of your thinking? On um, this? Yeah, I mean, you know, John was my classmate at, at Brown and, you know, to sort of, we, we had worked together um, while we were at school um, on, a, on a project that um, brought speakers to, to, to um, shed light and sort of uh, share opinions and insights into what was going on in Southern Africa um, uh, while we were there. And then subsequently when we were graduating, I started working on movies and John started George. We talked about making some documentary films together. And then, you know, George really was, George Magazine really was, I think, uh, a very unique undertaking. And I think John was trying to kind of render some of the nuances of politics and politicians and issues um, in, in a more um, unique and digestible and modern way. So hopefully this program and the evolution of this program will um, extend John's hopes and ambitions for, you know, um, uh, communication and for uh, uh, storytelling. I think that many students at Brown and students at our peer institutions, they're of course consumers of film, documentary film. And of course they, they, they want to be critical consumers. So they, they, they want that kind of knowledge, but I'm finding more and more students, they want to, they want to be creators of right. this creative of creators of narrative through film, whether it's through the smartphone and that camera or something more, right. more um, technical. And, and so I think a lot of people are aspiring in some ways to follow in your footsteps. Well, you know, that, 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 that's, I mean, I, I think that it's, you know, it's never in a way it's never been easier to make movies or to tell visual stories. Um, the fact that, I mean, that people make movies with using a cell phone or there's so many, Easy, there's so many easier means digitally to, to tell a story rather than having to necessarily shoot it on film, which I, 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 again, I encourage people to try to still try to shoot things on film. But I mean, I think that we're trying and some of our, our efforts collectively with the, with the initiative through Watson has been to bring people who are kind of more um, uh, uh, mar to marquee filmmakers to the, to, to the university, but also to bring some younger practitioners, you know, who can engage students on a very practical level in terms of, okay, where do you, you know, where do you begin? You know, how do you begin? How do you, how do you, um, how do you uh, find a plat a visual platform for the stories that, you know, to pursue the stories that you are interested in telling or, or, or things that are happening that you think are important to share with a, with a larger audience. You know, Randy, you've been so central in so many films and projects, including Tiger King that have captured the moment for us. In the minute we have left, do you, do you have a piece of advice for people young or old who want to get into the business and, and yeah, tell narratives I mean, this way? I, I mean, I think my, 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 you know, my, 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 I think the, my best piece of advice is to find your peer community of people who want to do what, you know, who want to be involved in making movies or telling stories. I mean, you know, for me, in terms of my working on the, you know, doing the, doing music supervision or people who come to me saying, I want to work in music and film is that I said, well, find, find your peers who want to direct movies or produce movies and throw in with them. I think that's the most organic way to get involved in, in, in filmmaking. Thank you. And we are going to, if it's okay with you, we're gonna to turn to a Q and A for, for uh, folks who've been um, listening in uh, to the webcast. So 
what are your views on the film's blatant vilification of Carol Baskin? And what do you think this says about the role of documentary filmmaking? I, you know, at a certain point, she, you know, I don't know. I mean, I mean, Carol Baskin, she, she sort of wins at the end, you know, um, and she's a, she's a survivor. Um, you know, every, you know, it, it, it's sort of, it's it, in a sense, I mean, even though she, you know, like we were saying, she's, she becomes the adversary, you know, she, she, she plays the part of the villain in the Joe Exotic story where Joe Exotic is the villain in the Carol Baskin story. And on a certain level, you know, you, you one needs the other sort of for it to be compelling. So, I mean, I don't know that she's, you know, I don't know that uh, she's really the villain. It's just that Joe is so compelling um, that I think she sort of, get, she falls into that supporting role rather than in the leading role. I think maybe the concern, and I'm not trying to put words in Rahan uh, into your mouth for the question, but I guess there's, an, a, there's a related concern about kind of reinforcing misogyny uh, in the, you know, certainly Joe Exotic is, is yeah. pushing a lot of that message. Right, right. Um, yeah, I don't know quite what to say about that. Really. Yeah, yeah. And there is a, a question from uh, James, um, and he asks, in the case of a filmmaker like Wes Anderson, who has specific musical tastes, how do you bring your influence to bear in partnership with that director? How much of your taste and how much of the director's taste comprise a soundtrack in that well, instance? Well, I, I think what, you know, I think in the, in the ideal situations, is say, for instance, working with Wes, is that oftentimes we sort of establish a musical dialogue for the particular project. So in terms of it's sort of not necessarily what my taste is or what his taste is, it's sort of like, what is the, what is the musical need of the specific project or what world are we living in? Or what are the, you know, what are the potential musical elements that we could bring to bear? Um, you know, ideally, it 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 is great when you and a director you know see eye to eye on every musical choice but oftentimes it's a it's a dialogue and things go back and forth and where you know by virtue of that collision that creative collision that you decide or you land on something that is transcends each of your individual tastes you know um i mean obviously when you work with somebody some of the directors that I've worked with over the course of the time, I certainly have insight and sensitivity to things they like and they don't like, you know? So we're, let me just add, um, ask a little bit further. So when you're working with somebody longer term, Wes Anderson, Martin Scorsese, right. I, I assume they want to keep working with you because you've, you've already developed a common understanding, a common language. Yeah. And, and also some of it early on too, is that, you know, in terms of just to keep pushing and to not settle, and to try to deliver everything that is possible, you know, to bring the full strength of, to, 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 to push, to allow the music to deliver with as much strength and vitality as possible in each and every moment in a movie. Do, do you have all of this music in your head? Or are you doing research? How does, yeah. how does it work? Yeah, I mean, again, I mean, I have a certain amount of, uh, you know, I have a certain musical geography that's born out of my life experience and my, my my long love of music and popular music and but I, but again it's it's this is where sometimes i think some of my you know academic training or my or my life in you know my 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 um where scholarship kind of is a valuable asset in the sense of going and doing research you know i mean i did the show boardwalk empire which was the first series the first season was set in 1920 well you know, nobody that I knew was really an, was an expert in that era. So, you know, I really had to both consult uh, 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 libraries and collections and finding people who were expert who would sort of um, lend me uh, their expertise and ultimately hoping to become somewhat more expert on these things. Um, but, you know, again, it's, it's like, I can't tell you, you know, even, even, even periods of time that I lived through, it gets a little bit fuzzy. Was that 1988? Was that 1992? And so really you have to turn back and, and really do the research and really get a sense of, you know, to dig in and think like, okay, well, what would be popular in 
uh, Oklahoma in 1920 and how would people listen to that music? Because say in 1920, it was before there was radio. Right, right. Yeah, as somebody, you know, in my case, I really love listening to music, but I know nothing about music. And it's, it's really, for me, neat when I'm watching a film and the soundtrack, it's songs I know, but it's so cool the way they've been put together or that they're matched in a particular way. And I know that's your hand or as you're referring to music that I'm just not at all familiar with, but the whole package of it when presented yeah. really is compelling. Right. How do you, how do you, how do you, um, collect music, say in a story where if, even if it's somewhat alien, how do you make it so it's relatable, you know, uh, which are relatable, I guess, is the word of the day. Um, and, and again, I'll also say is that, you know, oftentimes in terms of what a music supervisor does is that, you know, I'm not the person, I don't pick the songs. I mm -hmm. work with the directors. It's a director's medium. Directors pick the song. I work with in support of the directors. The directors and I have a conversation. The directors and I work in tandem to land on what is the best way to plot the music in a, in, in a story. Yeah, Luca actually has a question related to that. Luca asks, while I assume most of your role occurs in the post-production phase, were you involved during the earlier, more foundational stages of the creation of the docuseries for Tiger King, for, for any project really? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I would say in terms of, um, you know, I alluded to before is that, um, uh, Oftentimes, there's, a, there's an on-camera musical element, right? A character in the show, in a movie, is a singer, you know, or there's a wedding band, or there's, you know, somebody's going to sing along to a song on the radio. So those things have to be dealt with in the pre-production stages. And with the directors that I have an ongoing relationship, you know, I tend to be involved in the earlier stages, even if it's, there isn't much of an on-camera need for music. Um, and then there are times where, you know, you are... There, there, there's generally once a year, there's a movie that sort of hit a wall musically. They've been working on it. I haven't been involved and they just need a fresh perspective to sort of help establish a, a more compelling uh, musical element, you know? And then, um, and then there are times where it's just sort of a, you play. And I would say this is probably a, some of the case with, with, with Tiger King where you just, they, they just need somebody largely the, or the primary task is like, corralling all the music, getting permission to use all the music, replacing things that they can't afford, extending some of the inspirational, you know, because again, it has to, the story has to play out, even though the episodes are standalone, there is sort of an overview of it that, 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 that everybody is hoping to maintain musically. That's great. Alex has a question that's particular to, to Tiger King. Did you have certain musical motifs in mind for each of the storylines or each of the characters? And, and what were they? I don't think they really, I mean, again, there, there's the, there's the, there were musical elements that I think were motifs that were established by the story, but I don't think we, we, we really, the music department, we really didn't, we didn't really try to force any kind of musical overview on it. Really, it was again because it it, it it gets as the as you know as you know all you're working on a on on a series say where there there are multiple episodes and at the beginning it's all very kind of um, experiment. You, you know, there's a lot of experimenting, and as the story narrows, as as you get closer to being finished, there becomes an increasing urgency to sort of get it in shape and get it and get it done, you know? And so again, as, as it narrows and you've been working on it and there are musical elements or musical pieces that they've been working with, it creates kind of an urgency and momentum to sort of get it done. And, and so I don't know if that really makes sense, but it, it's just, yeah. it, 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 it's, it's, it's serving this really big story. You know, it's in terms of like, it's a lot, it's, it's, it's a lot of story that was there to, to sort of get music under. Yeah. Alex has an, another follow-up about working, your work with editors. So he points out that scenes can be cut to music um, or the, mu the music can be added or composed for edited scenes. How yeah, does that I mean, work? I don't know that this was necessarily the case in so much in, 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 um, Tiger King, but you know, sometimes, oftentimes, 
I, I would say most often, oftentimes it's too often, <laughs> is that I'm left to make the music work within an edited section of a movie. In, 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 in a more ideal situation, you know, when you're working in tandem with a picture editor and the director, is that, you know, there's, a, there's, enough, um, there's enough time and enough interest in saying like, hey, I, you know what, if you could give me another four seconds, we can really make this much more satisfying musically. You know, so ideally in a situation yeah. where you find, okay, this song works here and an editor says, all right, let me work with it for a minute and let me, let me massage it. Let me, let me get, let me, let me give, let's let it breathe for a, a, another beat or two so we can really make the music uh, more satisfying. Interesting. We can come back to uh, technical issues and, but uh, Luca has a question about more generally the industry. Luca asks, what's your reaction been to the way that people access music in the digital age? I mean, you know, to, 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 to lean on, you know, one of the classic cliches of life is that, you know, it kind of is what it is. You know, the genie is not going back in the bottle. Um, so I'm old enough in that I, you know, when I first started doing music supervision, I mean, at a certain point we used to have to go and take, actually take like an LP or a, or a cassette and actually transfer it to film, have a transfer to film stock every time you wanted to try something in an editing room. And then it used to be that you, you know, I, I would literally, I would travel to, I live in New York and oftentimes a lot of the work I was doing was in Los Angeles. I would literally travel transcontinentally with suitcases of CDs. Right. So in a sense, for me, on a basic level, the digital revolution has made my work a lot easier to do. And that, you know, I don't you know I would go and I would they would send me a scene on a VHS and I would have to download it. Then I would put the music on it and I would upload it on another VHS and I would send it by via FedEx. And then half times you would send it to my and say, oh, yeah, we cut that scene out of the movie. You know? <laughs> now I can get a quick time of a scene. And in 10, 15 minutes, I can put 10 choices together and send it into the editing room, wherever it would be. So I would say largely, I appreciate the facility of the digital life. And I can find, you know, I have, I can, I can, I, where I, I would have an idea for a song for a film. And I'd say, okay, well, I'll get up early. I'll go to Tower Records. Maybe they'll have it. Now the, the world of music is so accessible to me. On the other hand, I, you know, I, I wish that, you know, I wish that people had a little bit more patience to listen to music and they, that had a little bit more, uh, a little bit more patience to sort of let something play out, you know? And so I think that the, it, the analog, the, 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 the life of an analog, a music supervisor in the world of analog, there was that extra beat where you say to a, an editor, will you try this in the scene? They would say, okay, go take a walk and come back, right? And there was a moment of contemplation when you put something there, it was considered a little bit more. Now it's a little bit more like now, now next. <laughs> <laughs> right. So that it's uh, the, the ability just to cut it. It's a, a bit like reading an article or something. There's always the desire to go click on, on something else. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, but again, I think, I think that never, uh, it's never been easier to access the world of music, which is great. Do you feel that the, digital era has changed your relationship to artists? You know, has it become easier, harder, different working with the artists and getting rights? Well, and I think that, I think that, I think that the, the digital revolution made certain artists who were adverse to licensing their music into movies and commercials more interested in doing it because they weren't necessarily getting the income from record sales that they had previously. Yeah. You know, it's a slightly similar area. What about platforms like Netflix and the the computer screen, the TV, the screen, small screen becoming the place and maybe not great audio quality yeah. becoming the place where a lot of people are viewing these projects? I mean, it, it's a reality, right? That it's a reality that people of a certain age will, are going to just listen to music on their phones, right? And, and I don't think that there's any... Um, there is any um, inherent uh, allegiance to high or higher fidelity. But, you know, I think that, I think once some of the digital natives sort of get older, that maybe I think people will be drawn back to more fundamental ways of watching and listening and they don't want to be so, 
completely um, uh, magnetized by their phones, you know? And I think it's interesting. I mean, I think I'm wondering if during this period of quarantine, if people are taking another moment to say, you know what, I, it's, you know, let's watch it on the bigger screen. Yeah, I, I, I feel that way. I mean, this is the moment for the Netflix type platforms where we're all, you know, prevented basically from socially yeah. engaging. But then again, we, we watch something like Tiger King and it's a social experience. You, yeah. you want to talk about it. Everybody's seen the same thing. Right. And it's, right. it's, um, well, there's an interesting article. If anybody, you know, in the New York Times today, they launched this new service Quibi. I think that's how you pronounce mm -hmm. it, which is basically shorter form uh, content for, because uh, we've built on the note, built on recognition that so much is being consumed by younger people on the phone. And, and it was an interesting critique of the content, how it was just sort of not really special enough, you know, and that it was, it was limited by its formula of like only saying, you know, 10 minute episodes of stories. Um, but, you know, I just would encourage anybody who's listening, and it seems like we maybe have Alexander, Rahan, and Luca, and, and you and me, Ed. But um, Usually I find people are a little shy about asking. asking but, um, I could see there are a bunch of attendees out there. But, um, you know, I really encourage people to go to the movies. I mean, it was such a formative part of my, my um, childhood and my adulthood, young adulthood, just like, really surrendering to the big screen. Um, so I, I, I hope that the current crisis doesn't decimate the theatrical experience because I think it really is a, 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 a very impactful one. Were there particular films, I don't want to put you on the spot, but any particular films that just made a huge impact on you? Well, I, so many of them. I mean, you know, I'm of an, you know, growing up in the, in the 70s and, in in you know, early 70s, I mean, you know, you know, off the top of my head, say the French Connection, Shampoo, the Godfather movies, you know, all the Woody Allen movies. I mean, there was, I would go and I, I mean, luckily I, thankfully for me, I grew up in New York City and we would go see five movies in a weekend. So it was really fun. And I, 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 I on a certain level, I think that certain kids don't even, you know, the fun that they're missing by going to the movies, you know. What's been a unique challenge you faced as a music supervisor and, and, and how did you approach it? Um, I mean, the, the, it's a challenge. You know, I've all, I always wanted to work with the, the, the best filmmakers, you know, and I guess part of the challenge is to sort of keep them happy in a way. I mean, that's always the challenge. And I, keeping them happy by making sure that you are just insisting on fighting for the best and most perfect musical moments in each and every situation, you know? And again, sometimes that's, you know, sometimes it, 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 the music really doesn't want to call attention to itself, but, you know, so there's the, the sort of the perfect underscoring moment because it's really all about storytelling. You know, the music has to help tell the story. And, and um, so it's always, it's a persistent challenge. And I think if I, in my career, you know, going on, having worked now on more than 150 movies, you know, to, just to really insist with myself that I continue to make every effort to help and protect every story that I get involved with. You know, as we were talking earlier, I was thinking about the differences between um, uh, uh, fictional film, basically, and documentary film. In your work, do you, does it really matter to you at all? Does it matter whether you're working on a documentary versus a regular film? Um, you know, it's... It's different. It's different. I mean, I, I, I enjoy, I, I've enjoyed the documentaries that I've worked on. Um, but I would say that really my primary focus is, is working on feature films, you know, in terms of like, that's where I feel, um, you know, that's where I feel most at home, at work. 
Yeah, it may be hard to put into words, but it, but is it the case that in feature films, you just feel there's more room for artistic expression? You know, I mean, there, there, there tends to be more opportunity for, say, for montage, you know, and also more, so oftentimes more opportunity for, you know, it's fun to do when you have on-camera music, you know, where you're, you're creating music that will be performed on film, you know. But I've, look, I've worked on some really special documentaries. Um, I got involved with Tiger King because I, I had worked previously with one of the producers, Chris Smith, who himself is a director. Um, and he cr- directed a movie, it was either last year or the year before last, called Jim and Andy, about Jim Carrey and sort of his um, taking on the role of Andy Kaufman. And Chris is right. a really unique and interesting filmmaker. Um, I worked with Rory Kennedy on a film she made about the surfer Laird Hamilton, and that was really fun. Um, um, so I don't know. I don't. I. I. I, I guess. I, I guess. I find that I would say that working on documentaries is a little bit more of like a of a treat, you know, in terms of it being just a little bit different and allows me to work with sort of different um, different filmmakers um, and and to sort of try to bring some of the insight that I've learned from working on feature narratives to documentary storytelling. You mentioned just before about um, that it's really exciting to create music for a a project, a feature film maybe. Can you give an example? Um, Well, I mean, even I would say, you know, I would say in terms of say with Boardwalk Empire that, you know, learning about early, you know, the birth of jazz really in American popular music in the 1920s and big bands and the evolution of that, you know, I mean, I think we recorded over the course of six or seven seasons, you know, hundreds of songs, you know, and to me at that era of, of, uh, of, of music, it's, it's at a certain point, the emergence of kind of the, 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 the American musical vernacular in the 1920s um, in a, say around p- prohibition I mean, it's almost like music was like, that music was like punk rock on a certain level. Yeah, right. And it was so raw and exciting and great. And it, to me, that was just wonderful because it was, it opened up a whole other world of music that I hadn't lived in. And so that was particularly exciting. Yeah, that's fantastic. And that's the, that's the project that you won one of your two Grammys yeah, for, right? Yeah. yeah. And then I guess on the other side, I would say people are familiar with um, Wes's, Wes, An- Wes Anderson's movie, The Life Aquatic. Um, was that I love that movie <laughs> that you know we have this David Bowie motif that runs through the the story and but the question of like getting involved early on is that I used to meet Wes when he was writing the script I would meet with him you know every weekend every Sunday and I'd read the new pages as they were being written and one day there was a a, a line in the script that said Pele goes on deck and performs a David Bowie song in Portuguese and that was really the only scripted indication right and then when we discovered um when we discovered um, Sao George and that he just brought this magnificent artistry to transforming David Bowie into Bossa Nova. And we recorded 13 songs that were performed on camera. I mean, that was very exciting, you know, and was a combination of, all, of Wes's inspiration, um, our preparation and the genius of Sao George sort of meeting the genius of David Bowie under the, under the under the uh, marquee of Wes Anderson, you know, so. Yeah, I mean, I, it makes me ever so slightly sad in the sense that I, as a viewer, I don't appreciate all that's going into that, but then I'm watching, I love those, <laughs> I love those Wes Anderson movies and the Life Aquatic especially. And so, you know, it just kind of washes over me and I absorb it without appreciating what went into it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that's good. I mean, I, hopefully, you know, these things don't feel labored. They feel like they're naturally born. The, there are just a couple more questions. We have like uh, three minutes or so. So we'll try to go through these pretty quickly. Thanks so much, Randy. You've been really uh, generous with your time. So Dan asks, were there any musical moments in films that you remember noticing when you were growing up? You mentioned a number of powerful yeah, I would say I would say really like American Graffiti was really a, a real core inspiration for me in terms of the, the, the magnitude of the musical element in that story. And also that, you know, watching it as whatever a 12 year old, or is that, you know, it opened up, like I was talking about the, the, the music of the twenties, 
it opened me up to the music of the 50s that, you know, I, I, I didn't know, you know, and so that to me was a real, a real important musical film that, that I guess also at a certain point led me to understand that some people were involved in putting those songs into the movie <laughs> right? and how it served the story. And really there was no original score in that film. It was, it was completely song driven. Um, and then otherwise, and this is a film at a certain point, I would love to show it Brown was shampoo. There's this incredible, I mean, the music in shampoo, again, rendering that age of Aquarius that I really had a, a, a deep fascination with. Yeah, you and I had talked about that on another occasion. I went back and watched Shampoo, and yeah, I, I know what you're talking about with just these iconic songs. Yeah, I mean, it's incredible is that, that, you know, at the end of the movie, there's that party scene that they go to, and he walks in, and it's Lucy in the Sky with yeah. Diamonds. Yeah. There's a great moment, too, where, like, all of a sudden, there's a record skip, and it goes to a Jefferson Airplane song, and he, Jimi Hendrix, and it's just incredible, you know, incredible musical collage. Right, but very subtle. It's operating really in the background. It's not. It's not a movie that you leave thinking, "Wow, there were, there was all this music in it." Yeah, really interesting. And this question actually relates to our whole JFK Jr. Right. Um, film initiative. Is there a greater responsibility to serving truth in the documentary form rather than the feature film form? Uh Probably. Yeah. I mean, again, I mean, just by virtue of being a doc, you know, the, you know, it's documenting something, but I think obviously, you know, I think that, I think it makes clear in, in, in Tiger King and, and say, I was thinking about a movie called like um, the thin blue line or Morris's yeah. thin blue line. There is no, you know, there is no simple truth. Right. And so by virtue of what film, what these films can do is, by giving you the different perspectives, it sort of it, it sort of allows the viewer to sort of get a rounder sense of a greater, broader truth, you know. And and oftentimes to say there also is sort of factual discovery in some of these documentaries. You know, if you look at Coup Fifty Three, right, is that it told a story of a particular period of time a, on a certain level in a in a historical sense, right? That these certain things did happen. It's irrefutable in terms of the, 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 the headline of events, right? Yet, on the other hand, when you get into sort of the humanity of it, you see the complications, the competing interests, the competing perspectives. And so two, render, two, two different perspectives, right, where each person would say that the other person is not telling the truth, we then get to see both perspectives and so appreciate sort of the larger truth, right? So, yeah, but it seems like such a huge responsibility for people involved in filmmaking because they, in telling the narrative, they're using image and sound that goes right to the heart, practically, like right to the emotions, maybe right. without passing through reason entirely. Right, well, again, I mean, it's also that's, I mean, I think the doc, what documentaries, aren't just necessarily giving you factual details. They're also rendering some of the emotional elements as well, which is, you know, I mean, life as we live it is never so simple to classify, really. We all know that there, there that with it, for the most part, we all navigate the gray area and the shadows of perspective. And so I think that, you know, documentary films respect that while, you know, maybe bringing certain high points, low points to focus. Yeah, it's art and truth coming together yeah. and then maybe being observed critically. Yeah. Well, Randy, you've been fantastic. I'm sorry, but only one thing, we're, we're out of time. Okay. Uh, but I'd really like to urge all of our listeners and viewers to check out Tiger King on Netflix. If you haven't already, most people have already watched it. Okay. And if you like the kind of programming we're doing here, please subscribe to the Watson Institute's Trending Globally podcast, which is available wherever you access your podcasts. And Randy, thanks again. Okay, terrific. Thanks, Ed.